Okay, there we go. Live. Uh, I think, just trying to figure everything out at the moment. Give me just a minute or three. There we go. That's a good sign. That's there. I'll pop that over there. Sorry about this. Okay. There we go. Uh, oh, I see there are two people live at the moment watching us. Excellent. Well, hopefully this evening will be interesting. Uh, and I hope you got the notes. I posted them on Facebook just below. And um, obviously they'll, they're on the website as well. And I thought what I might do this evening is talk about Gnosticism. Which is, it's one of the early church heresies, but it's kind of more than that. And I think it's an important conversation that we be aware of broadly, so we have some picture of kind of what's going on and how the term operates and those sorts of things. So kind of from a very basic concept, um, the word Gnosticism is connected to the word knowledge. Uh, and there's, in one sense, there's no such thing as a Gnostic. In that, uh, all the different Gnostic traditions kind of self-allocated by a different name. Um, but, so, so Gnosticism is an umbrella term for kind of a group of teachings that, um, that kind of pick up on this topic. On this topic. Um, and... The Gnosticism the, that it spoke to was about a personal, spiritual, special knowledge. And if you've got the notes, you'll see how bold at each of those, because they each kind of work together. And then that special, uh, spiritual, personal knowledge was uh, what in Christianity we might call salvation. So... So this is the, the, the topic, if you will. Hang on a moment. I've got a dog that wants to come in. Seriously. Oh, anybody want a spare dog? No. He's a good puppy. Um, so let's see. Where was I? Okay. Now, in terms of personal, uh, I was trying to think of what's kind of a, a good way to access this. And in a way, it's the opposite of, uh, say mathematical or scientific knowledge. You know, in math, pretty much anyone can be taught it and they can access it and those sorts of things. But the personal stuff, you you can't access in that same way. Um, and in kind of in a positive sense, you might talk about love. You know, you could be in love and you can try your best to describe it, but unless somebody else is in love, they just can't see things in the same way you see them. So it's that personal, almost experiential. Spiritual as opposed to material. Um, so, so what does it mean in this context to be spiritual? Well, it, it kind of means what it means now. It's to do with the other, the non-material. And we'll get more into that later on uh, as to why the non-material matters in the way that it does. Uh, and special. Now, uh, the special, it, it's kind of, there's a uniqueness to it. And again, we'll come to that as we kind of progress our way through it. And the knowledge is uh, the realization. Some people, it's not in the notes, but I think it's interesting, so I'll tell you anyway. So some people actually think that uh, Gnosticism had its kind of origins in some early Buddhist teachings that kind of moved from the East-West towards Greece and things like that. And, and, and teachings moved backwards and forwards like that. But that kind of the notion of um, enlightenment, meaning changing the way you see, well, this knowledge isn't of new things, but changes the way you see those things. Um, and in each of those, then, you kind of get this category that is, this knowledge then is, is kind of superior to any other style of teaching. So this is this Gnosticism. It is personal it is spiritual, it is unique, it is special, and it is knowledge or perhaps even awareness or perception or those sorts of things. Um, so yeah, I hope that kind of helps. So 
given that we don't really, there isn't a thing called Gnosticism per se, but it's kind of a, a an umbrella term, it's hard to track the historical origin of those ideas. Um, some of the early church fathers, however, uh, kind of placed the blame, if you will, on um, Simon Magus. And you can read about him in Acts chapter 8. Uh, it seems unlikely. When the Nag Hammadi scrolls were discovered, um, part of what was in there was a whole range of texts that we didn't have previously, uh, Gnostic texts. Um, and some of those predated Christianity. And so uh, the, the kind of the, the pre-Christian Gnosticism seems to have been uh, uh, an expression or perhaps a reaction to Judaism um, and kind of Platonism and Neoplatonism. Now, the, that's a kind of an older philosophical idea. And Neoplatonism took the ideas of Plato and gave them a... A mystical bent, if you will. So, so the early Gnosticism seems to have actually been a combination of sort of apocalyptic Judaism and Neoplatonism, and these two ideas sort of merging together to give us this sort of picture. Now, although I said there's no such thing as Gnosticism per se, and it's an umbrella term, the umbrella term picks up particularly the knowledge, but it also includes this, um, a cosmology. So a cosmology is your picture of the universe. Now, um, you've possibly heard that the kind of the ancient cosmology in the Old Testament is sort of, you know, picture a saucer, at, which is the earth, and then a dome that goes over the top, and the stars are sprinkled on the dome and the planets move kind of in the dome. And the ancient sort of Roman cosmology was similar and, and um, the stars that moved differently were the homes and also the very presence of the gods. So Mars, the planet, uh, was Mars the god of war, but it was also the home of Mars the god of war. Um, yeah. So the cosmology uh, in Gnosticism tends to a fairly complex sort of thing. So in a sense, it starts with the one, sometimes called the monad, because that means the one, um, who is the sort of primary, divine, unified, pure energy, this pure goodness, way beyond anything we could understand. And then out of him flows, or not him, out of the one, uh, flows a number of emanations, I'll say. Emanations. Uh, and they are di dyads, and, that, and essentially they male and female versions of. Uh, and then from them comes another generation. And, so, and part of what you get in Gnosticism is this separate, this layers being placed between the one, the monad, and humanity, down at the bottom. Well, not humanity, but earth and material stuff. We'll get to that in a second. Um, but can you see how there's, it's kind of, it's, it's coming down in a sort of a generational way? Anyway, so um, in one, in some of the Gnostic myths, and the reason I say some is, like, you know, there, there, there are places where the Gnostics argued with each other. Anyway, in one of these Gnostic myths, um, uh, we get this one, and the term is Eon, um, who was called Sophia or Pistis. And she acts without her counterpart. And we'll get to the counterpart later on. And so it creates, like tries to recreate the heavens, um, but fails. And it's kind of like a shadowed heaven. And out of that shadowed heaven come the material realms, the material realms. Um, uh, oh, I've got a comment there. Ah, oh, it's from Simon. Hi, Simon. Uh, I'm glad you're enjoying things. Um, and so, uh, 
Where was I? My brain got distracted by the comment. So, um, I, so in that, and what you get is you kind of get this idea that the material realm is a far less spiritual, pure realm than the spiritual realm of the monad. However, part of what's important to recognize is that it's in this material realm. There are still divine sparks. Uh, and, and part of the creation mythology is that Sophia is ripped apart and this divine spark is scattered throughout the material realm. Remember how I said it's special knowledge? Well, the knowledge is special, as in it's for special people, because it's only for those that have this particular divine spark in them. You see, most people don't have the right divine spark, and so they will never have access to this gnosis, this special knowledge. Um, so, yeah, gnosis is just the kind of the technical term for this special knowledge. Um, and then the idea was that having realized that, you know, in the end, whenever the end might be or whatever, um, you kind of get to return to the spark, at least gets to return to that kind of cosmic one, the one. Um, so now, hopefully you kind of starting to see now, I've, I've carefully not been talking about particularly Christian Gnosticism, um, but rather sort of generic Gnosticism. But you can probably see some of the places where uh, Christian texts and Christian ideas are quite similar to some of the Gnostic ideas. Um, and, you know, it's important to be aware of those things. And, yeah... So, so, what do we do with that? Well, there are now, moving into kind of the Christian era, so about 100 AD to up to about 200, maybe 250 AD, you get this kind of flowering of Christian Gnosticism. In fact, some people would suggest that perhaps if you took all the different Gnostic groups, there were more Gnostic Christians than non-Gnostic Christians. Got to be careful how I kind of get my tongue, that tongue twister going on there. So, um, and, and the reason I say you've got to remember that there were various different Gnostic groups and they quite often had a bit of argy-bargy with, argy -bargy with each other. Um, so, there are, as I said, there are a number of these um, Christian Gnostic texts. Uh, and they've been translated for us, which is really cool. A lot were discovered at Nagamadi. A lot weren't preserved, except for in that particular environment. Some were. Um, and if you actually want to have a look at them, uh, academics have done translations, they've put their translations out, and they collected, and I put a link on the note, um, and it's, or you can just Google uh, the Nag Hammadi Library. And it's just, you know, it's there. So, um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's there, and if you, you can read it. This, this isn't particularly well hidden if you can Google it and find it. So anyway, when it comes to, I'm going to call it Christian Gnosticism, not that it was really Christian, but Gnosticism that kind of circled around and was part of the Christian worldview, if you will, the Christian milieu, there were a number of uh, views on, on Jesus. Um, so, in some of those, Jesus was in fact the embodiment of the supreme monad, the one. Uh, and so you can sort of see how that would have worked well with many Christians' ideas, you know, Jesus is God incarnate. But part of that was to say that the one was so divine that there was never any way in which Christ could be uh, anything like human because human remember human mortal material fleshly wrong evil in a sense um, on the other hand uh, some taught that um, Jesus was kind of the counterpart of Sophia 
Uh, so remember I mentioned Sophia was the one who created the material realm uh, in an attempt to recreate heaven, the heavenly realm, and failed. And so the idea is that Jesus is not the one, but a, 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 a like a, yeah, and, and is coming along to try and fix this. So his teachings are there to try and help um, open the eyes, if you will, uh, help people realize their divine spark, and so that that spark can then return to the one. Um, now, certain parts of the New Testament, they work really well with this kind of Gnosticism, this picture of Gnosticism. Um, you know, John's Gospel is rich in dualism. In the, you know, there's light and darkness stuff that's in there. So John 1, 5, uh, you know, the darkness has not overcome the light. Uh, John three nineteen, We get this light and darkness language, this dualism that's so strong and is so central uh, to Gnosticism, where there was the, 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 the material realm and the realm above. Um, and that kind of dualism, so central in Gnosticism, we see an expression of dualism in John's Gospel. Paul, uh, at times, uses very negative language to speak about the flesh. Um, and we get all this kind of ideas, you know, you know fleshly minded or carnally minded. Um, so it, it is really easy to see how um, it kind of, it, it really does work very well. Um, and, you know, remember I said Gnosticism is this special knowledge. Well, it's really easy to interpret Jesus saying, you know, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. As speaking to this, there is knowledge for some. Uh, you know, if you've got the right ears, well, then you're going to hear and understand. But if you don't have the right ears, if you're just some sort of basically... Uh, mortal flesh bag. Um, sorry, I've just been watching Troll Hunters with my son. Um, but, you know, if, you, if you're just a material being, then you won't hear and understand. So it's kind of a filtering system, if you will. It really is easy to see how parts of the New Testament strongly correlate with Gnosticism. So why was it fought as a heresy? Uh, and And Irenaeus particularly really fought tooth and nail against Gnosticism. Um, and he, he, he won, obviously. Well, not just he, but uh, yeah, Gnosticism uh, was defeated in the end. So why does Irenaeus argue against it? Well, on all, almost all the grounds, in fact. So he argues that the, that the God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New Testament. The God of the Old Testament is the God of Jesus Christ. Uh, and he argues that on the basis that this is the God that Jesus speaks to and refers to. But he also argues it on the basis of the prophets. You see, he says the prophets, messengers of, the God, of God, who look forward to Jesus Christ. Now, if the God of the Old Testament wasn't the God of Jesus Christ then the God of the Old Testament wouldn't have sent prophets to prepare the way for Jesus Christ. So you see, you see how, how Irenaeus is making that argument? Um, he also, uh, he's a bishop, and he's, as a bishop he says, well, no, 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 the knowledge isn't secret. The knowledge isn't secret. It's the same secret, it's the same knowledge that bishops teach everywhere. So part of his uh, argument against Gnosticism was just the universality of the bishops' teachings. Now, bishops used to be like the... Um, these days, bishops, uh, poor guys, um, they mostly are, they have a lot of kind of administrative responsibilities. Um, but in the days of Irenaeus, they were heavily involved in teaching theology and in teachings. Uh, um, and, and, you know, we still have this when we say things like, you know, the throne of the bishop is the chair of a teacher. Um, and so he was saying, well, look, this is the teaching that all the, the real teaching 
no secret knowledge. The real teaching is the teaching that all the bishops are teaching. We're all giving you the same information. No secret information here. Um, uh, the other thing of, that are from Irenaeus is that he saw creation as being fundamentally good. And in fact, he saw it as a path to God's glory and glorification, which is very much tied with the incarnation. So we have this idea that Jesus is God with us. Why would God be with us if, if the material world was beyond redemption, if there was no kind of salvation in the material world? Um, you know, although the book of Revelation can be read with kind of Gnostic lenses on, it's talking in a substantial way about the refreshing of a material existence. So Irenaeus fights against the dualism. He fights against the God of the Old Testament, God of the New Testament. And he also fights against... Um, think of the incarnation. Uh, Jesus is, you know, the humanity and the divinity. And, and many of the Gnostics either... You picture a coin standing on its end, balanced on its end, you know, on its on side. And many of the Gnostic traditions won't. They'll push the coin over onto... You know, the divine face is up, or they'll push the coin over the other way to the human face is up, the non-divine face. And Irenaeus is balancing that coin, saying, no, 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 both faces are showing. Um, and so he, he's, uh, yeah, uh, he's fighting back, in a sense, against that. Um, yeah, so, so, so that's part of why. Uh, he, he, Irenaeus and, and many of the other church fathers fought against Gnosticism. Now, I've heard it said that Gnosticism is still the biggest heresy facing the church today. Uh, and I think to a certain extent that's right. And I kind of want to stick with the metaphor of the coin. Um, so much good theology is about balancing the coin. It's about keeping things on, you know, upright. And heresy is when we, we, we sacrifice one face of the coin for another. Uh, and so it's often when we, we take an idea and we push it beyond where it's helpful. Um, so where do I see Gnosticism in the church today? Well, often there's not that same very sophisticated cosmology with multiple layers and all the rest of it between us and God. Um, but a lot of places, a lot of Christians still teach this fundamentally flawed universe, material existence, which is distinct from a perfect creator God. And so they, they will see the material world as being without the capacity for redemption. I don't know if you ever came across those. There was a series of books, and I think they made some movies. I only read one or two of the books um, about um, the Left Behind series, you know, uh, and the, the real Christians were going to go to be raptured to heaven, and, and you know, and us heretics were not. Um, well, anyway, uh, that, that series strongly pushes this idea that uh, other than this kind of you know, this few uh, sort of elect, chosen, uh, special, the, the world is not worth saving. It's, it's so, and, and you, you see, that now obviously in the Left Behind series, it's kind of pushed to an extreme, but you, you see this idea of anti the body, anti materiality, anti um, the incarnation uh, in, in some areas. Also, also, I, I get the distinct impression that there are a lot of people who teach kind of a secret knowledge as the road to salvation. Um, some traditions teach what's called predestination. Uh, and they say you're either destined to be saved and go to heaven, or you're destined to not be saved. Now, in its kind of or original space, that teaching was remarkably freeing because it said, hey... 
what you do doesn't impact. So what you do is determined only by your ethics. You can't buy your way into heaven. Either you're going or you're not going, you can't change that. So be a good person because it's the right thing to do, which is remarkably freeing theology, actually. But it becomes very easy. You can see the coin is pushed over. It's unbalanced. And there are the special ones who are, you know, the ones that come to my church usually. Or that was said with irony, by the way. Um, so, yeah. Um, so th there's that. Uh, one of the other areas I think we, we, we get kind of a um, Gnosticism very strongly still in the church is what, with what I would describe as biblical idolatry. It's this idea that uh, every phrase or word in the Bible can have only one meaning. And if you have access to that meaning, often by your own mystical personal experiences, which can't be tested, which can't be shared, then you get to determine the correct meaning of this passage. And it, it, it can't be tested. It's, 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 it's personal, it's special, uh, it's spiritual, and it's, it's, it's a particular worldview. And this is, in a sense, quite common. Now, I don't have a problem with a kind of a, a mystical experience uh, or, or a particular view on Scripture. But the locking down and the making of that knowledge unique and un, unshareable uh, takes you into the land of the Gnostic heretic in the modern context. David made a comment uh, just here. It says some modern cults seem to fit in Gnosticism. Yes. Now, when I said earlier that there were no people that called themselves Gnostics, that's actually no longer true. There are now people who would describe themselves as Gnostics. Um, uh, so, yes. But on the other hand, these elements, uh, they can be very enticing. You know, um, if you think about it, the, it would be very enticing to have that sense of certainty about the knowledge um, of something, you know, I know I'm right. That That's very enticing for a lot of people. Also, a lot of people, the teaching that the, that the world itself is bad is, is in a sense quite uh, attractive. I know it's, see, it shouldn't be, but it is because it's about being able to say, you know, the world is bad, it's doomed, um, but I'm saved. <laughs> Uh, and that's that's quite um, yeah quite quite tempting. So I think you're right, David. Um, uh, modern Gnosticism unhelpful. Uh, yeah, in out good bad salvation damnation. Uh, yeah. So it, you know modern Gnosticism, particularly the dualism. And you're right. It is it is supremely unhelpful. Um, yeah. And uh, look, it. it uh, you know, you, you make a comment there um, uh, that might be Paul or Alex, uh, that knowledge and power are closely related. And they are. Um, but I, I was just thinking, as I saw that comment, how very much it drives uh, conspiracy theories. You know, this idea that I can remember being told that there's this secret library in the Vatican um, with all these ancient texts that prove... All sorts of weird things. All sorts of weird things. But, um, I mean, they may, I'm sure there's libraries in the Vatican. But, as I pointed out earlier, most of the stuff you can just... You can Google it. And you get the best scholars in the world working through their translations and, and justifying it. Um, so, so, secret knowledge leads away from light for the world. Um, so, yeah, it, it is a very destructive view. I've been, to I've been told, but I'm not 100% sure it's true. But, I, yeah. There are people who will promulgate this kind of picture of the world. Um, 
at least partially just because that way they can justify a very poor environmental ethic. You know, don't have to look after the earth. It's rubbish. So we can chop down trees in the Amazon or dig up oil and burn it for, you know, whatever purpose. Um, because we don't have to look after the earth because the earth is doomed anyway. Uh, so, oh, I feel like that's a lot of information. Um, some good questions there. Thank you. Uh, hopefully they were interest, uh, helpful and I was able to speak to them. Um, obviously, uh, I'll get around to uploading this onto YouTube at some stage and the notes are already on the website. Um, and I think next time I do this, I'll be looking at some of the Christological heresies. So hopefully interesting for you as well. Uh, good night and uh, God bless.